Okay, now we are ready to continue our discussion of regression cost functions. And uh, the next important cost that I'm going to introduce here is called least absolute deviation cost, or briefly LAD. The least absolute deviation cost can be introduced according to this formula here. Uh, and again, uh, basically what we are dealing with is that if uh, you have a data set and uh, you have uh, fit some kind of response surface h of x, then uh, in the regression context you interpret h of x as a direct uh, estimate of the predicted of uh, response y itself. And uh, in this case, we're looking at the residuals, r sub i's, on every uh, data observation. And in this case, these residuals enter here. But what makes the least absolute deviation cost different from least squares cost is that now there is no square over here. There is no square. And instead, we're just taking residuals in their absolute value. Uh, residuals could be positive or negative. Once you take absolute value, you have a set of positive uh, uh, entities here, and then again we have this uh, normalizing factor 1 over n uh, that kind of brings things back to the individual observation level. So when you look at least absolute deviation cost or LAD uh, cost function, uh, the nice properties that it has is that now it, it's gotten more robust with respect to outliers. Why? Well, because uh, when you have an outlier uh, record, as we've shown out there, instead of taking the squared residual, now you're taking it in terms of absolute value. So you kind of minimize the impact that that outlier can make uh, as far as the contributing to your loss function. And things are, in general, uh, working much nicer in this setting. Now, the unfortunate part about LAD cost is that it may pose some computational challenges. So it, it handles outliers, it handles all of that stuff. Unfortunately, the presence of this absolute uh, uh, term uh, introduces all sorts of uh, numerical issues. Like if you take uh, a derivative of this, you would uh, face some issues around the zero region, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not easy to write a nice uh, kind of uh, compact, uh, easy to use uh, numeric algorithm that works with this particular cost. And it's a well-known issue, and that's why historically it occurs somewhat later. And uh, it, it, to this day, some algorithms may have issues uh, working with this specific type of uh, uh, cost function. Now, in uh, talking about least squares cost, we introduced it also from the statistical point of view. It turns out that the same uh, kind of uh, the same uh, introduction can be uh, set here for the LAD cost. And all we would have to change is that we would say that the conditional distribution of y given x, this time, instead of being normal, is going to be a double exponential. So if I skip all the constants, then basically it's going to have this kind of shape. And uh, again, it's a conditional distribution of y given x. And what we're essentially saying is that as we go from over the uh, uh, range of change of x, the mean of that, or the mode, or the median of the double exponential distribution becomes a function of x. And again, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this type of uh, distribution, like if this is my y, and uh, this part here is uh, h of x at this specific point, then uh, the PDF function of a double exponential distribution looks like this. Now, and that is different uh, to say what we saw before, which is the Gaussian function that would look like this. And this nice bell-shaped curve, which corresponds to basically least squares cost. In my case here, this a, a statistical assumption would correspond to LAD cost. And again, it's just something useful to keep in mind. And again, if you take the negative log likelihood of this, 
then as you can easily see, I would have to write something like this, uh, h of x sub i. And uh, again, if you take a log of product and do the cancellations, then you will essentially arrive at the summation, i goes 1 through n, of absolute value y sub i minus h of x sub i. And that essentially brought us back to this uh, j cost that we that was introduced. The double exponential distribution has this characteristic known as uh, thick tails. And that is how it allows the introduction of outliers. And that kind of a better characteristic in handling outliers. Now, there is not much uh, more that can be said about the LED cost. Uh, but what people tried to do a number of times is, uh, okay, let's say we have an at least squares cost that has all of these nice statistical pro mathematical properties, but it is not able to handle outliers. And then we have also this LED cost that handles outliers, but it's also kind of extreme because the double exponential distribution is a, is a pretty heavy tailed distribution. So it's kind of tempting to come up with uh, say, yet another type of uh, cost function that presumably, uh, hopefully, would combine these two co cost functions as some kind of intermediate case. And this is exactly what is done in the Huber-M cost. So on the next slide here, I'll talk about Huber-M cost. On the first glance, it's introduced as this horrendously uh, looking formula. Uh, but all that matters is that you need to observe that these terms here is what we know as residuals. And uh, these are the residuals that we looked at in all of the previous definitions of the cost function. Now, it is instructive to plot different cost functions based on the values of the residuals and how those individual components reflect them. So, for example, like see if uh, any cost function introduced so far has this summation sign over observations. So, whatever comes underneath that summation sign could be called as uh, a j sub i. That's the contribution into the cost function attributable to the current observation. And in other words, here I can plot, let's say, my residual r sub i, uh, and on the vertical axis I can plot j sub i. So in the case of, uh, and again I have a zero here, the zero residual, perfect prediction, in the case of least squares loss, least squares cost, what we had is we had a contribution to that error component on a quadratic scale. So it would look like this. Here and here. So you have this nice parabola. On the LAD cost, you had a somewhat different shape of this penalty. Uh, and of course, they all started at zero, but under LAD, you had the linear penalty. So it will go like this, and it will go like this. It's a little bit hard to draw using this graphics pad. Okay, now the quadratic uh, cost is you double the residual, you quadruple the amount of penalty. LED cost is linear, you double the residual, you double the amount of penalty. And we want to combine these two together into some kind of hybrid. What Huber-M does, it essentially uh, makes the following approach. When the residual is small, let's use least squares, I mean, let's use quadratic loss. So when the residual is small, we're going to trace the quadratic cost up until a certain point. Let's call it delta, and let's call it negative delta here. When the residual exceeds a certain threshold delta, this is when we switch from quadratic penalty to a linear penalty. And naturally, this resulted, uh, resulting cost uh, combines essentially the quadratic penalty for small residuals with the linear penalty for large residuals. And this is exactly what's represented in this formula. If the residual is small, so less than delta, then what we are applying is uh, 
quadratic penalty, so this is at least squares cost. But when the residual gets large, so here we have small residual, and here we have large. So when the residual is large, we apply essentially an LAD cost. And that's the most important thing here to understand. So the Huber-M cost combines the best qualities of the LS and LAD losses. So the only remaining issue that is uh, that need to be addressed is the parameter delta here. And the parameter delta is usually set automatically to a specific percentile of absolute residuals. And this is what we mean by that. Suppose you have, uh, again going back to where I started a few videos ago, and this is your uh, data set. You have, your, you have your observed response y, and then you've constructed a response surface h of x. That's the essence of the machine learning, supervised learning. And now you can always compute absolute value of your residuals, which is simply you take the difference between y sub i and h of x sub i and take the absolute value of that, and now you have all your residuals. Now, the most important thing at this point is that you can take these residuals and you can sort them descendingly such that here you'll get the max absolute residual and here you'll have a minimum absolute residual. So you take the min and the max and now you can identify the top 10% of observations. And these will be the largest absolute residuals, top 10%. You take the smallest of these residuals, and this becomes your parameter delta. So parameter delta can be derived from the current configuration of absolute residuals, and this way you don't even have to worry about it. And all you would normally need to set is what is the value of that percentile uh, that uh, is used internally in calculating this uh, uh, parameter delta. And that's essentially uh, what, what is usually meant by delta is set uh, automatically to a specific percentile of absolute residuals. So at this point, we learned three fundamental losses, uh, cost functions that are used in regression, least squares uh, loss, uh, at least absolute deviation cost, and the Huber-M that combines the best of the two. When you work with our tools, you'll see that uh, there's a lot of, uh, that are often these costs are explicitly set by the user, and most notably in the tree net, uh, the user has to set those, the losses that we're trying to optimize. And the regression case is kind of simple, because the response surface is uh, your actual predicted response, and then your goal, the, the goal is to try to optimize that response surface such that it has the best uh, interpretation as the predicted response. In the next video, we are going to move into the different type of predictive modeling, and that is a binary classification or the situation when the response variable is binary, and that opens up a whole new can of worms. So, so there's a whole new interpretation, and there will be a number of different approaches uh, in constructing specific types of cost functions in that setting.